all, and welcome to this screencast on bacteria and viruses. This is going to be a really fun unit. I love talking about bacteria and viruses and working with them in the lab, so I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So let's just get some background information, try to remember some of the previous things we've learned in this class. I know it's May, but we have learned a lot. So can you remember the three domains of life? Try to think about them right now. Well, if you thought of one was eukaryotes, you were right. Eukaryotes is a domain of life. Remember some of those char characteristics, right? They have a nucleus, they have organelles, uh, they have a cell membrane. Remember looking at this, this would be an example of an animal cell. Plants are also eukaryotes, so that's one domain. Another domain is archaea, so remember these like to live in really extreme environments. And the last one is bacteria. Remember that both archaea and bacteria are considered prokaryotes uh, versus eukaryotes. So remember prokaryotes don't have a nucleus in general. Their structure is much more simple. Um, so this is a, an example of a bacterial cell without a nucleus. Remember we just call this region a nucleoid uh, where the DNA is kept. And so what we're going to focus on um, this week is bacteria and then later in the screencast we're also going to talk a little bit about viruses. So some more background on bacteria. Remember from our evolution unit, prokaryotes were the first things to ever really come around. Remember talking about cyanobacteria that started to photosynthesize. So they've lived alone for over one billion years. They remain the most numerous and widespread organisms on earth. And do you believe this? The total biomass of prokaryotes is ten times that of all the eukaryotes, plants, animals combined. That is just crazy. Let's talk a little bit about size. They're much smaller, remember, than eukaryotes. So here's a nice scale. Eukaryotes are the largest. The, the cells themselves are the largest. And then prokaryotes are the second largest. And then we get into viruses, which are even smaller, and proteins, and all the way down to atoms. So this is where we're looking at for bacteria. Just some other interesting facts. Uh, might want, you might want to go brush your teeth after hearing this. More prokaryotes live in your mouth than the total number of humans that have ever lived. That's a scary thought. And there are ten times as many prokaryotes living in and on your body right this instant as the number of cells in your own body. Yes, that is very true. Here are some really cool pictures of different types of bacteria. Um, let's see, this is C. jejuni, this is E. coli, this is a staph bacteria. I'm not quite sure what this is, but I just think they're really cool looking. So you might be thinking, okay, i got all this stuff living on me. That can't be good. Well, in fact, bacteria are mostly good. Some are bad. Um, so the ones that are bad, we call them pathogenic, which just means they cause disease. Path means disease. Um, but most bacteria um, in general are beneficial, especially the ones on our bodies. Um, they decompose dead skin, cells, dead skin cells. They help provide us with essential vitamins and nutrients. And they actually help us um, against other pathogenetic organisms. So they help our immune system. Also remember we just learned about all those um, chemical cycles, especially in the nitrogen cycle. Bacteria are important um, in decomposing all of these uh, chemicals in our ecosystem. So we just talked about one function of bacteria, which was as our own human helpers, right? Especially in our colon, producing vitamin K for us. We also use bacteria in bioremediation, which is simply the use of organisms to help remove pollutants from soil, from air, from water. Um, so we use them to decompose and to treat sewage. Um, they can also help us clean up oil spills and toxic mine waste. So we're trying to put all these prokaryotes that are in our world to good use. But like anything, not, it's not all good, right? There are some disease-causing bacteria. And so you might be wondering, well, how do these bacteria actually cause disease? They release toxins, and there are two groups of toxins. One group are our endotoxins, um, which these are only released once that bacterial cell dies. And these produce things like septic shock, bacterial meningitis, and food poisoning. And then the other type is an exotoxin, which is actually um, secreted by the cell, so the cell doesn't have to be dead. And these produce things like lockjaw and toxic shock syndrome. Okay, let's look at the cell structure. This should look familiar. So one, these are some of the things I do want you to know. Maybe draw a quick picture in your notes. Um, but this is the nucleoid region where all the DNA is. Um, bacterial cells have cytoplasm just like we do. They have ribosomes just like we do. Um, they have a cell membrane just like we do. Um, this is the green here. Uh, they have a cell wall, which is in yellow, and some have a capsule. 
And then two other interesting things to note. Um, this is a flagella, so this will help the bacteria move. And then these guys are called pili, and these actually help the bacteria have sex. So the pili join up between two bacterial cells, and then this genetic information is transferred inside the pili, or the pilus, in between the two bacterial cells. Let's take a closer look at the cell wall. Um, so the cell wall has an important function in maintaining cell shape, uh, protecting them, and preventing the cell from bursting when we put it into a hypotonic environment. Remember that means lower solute, right? There are two types of bacteria according to their cell walls. The first is gram positive, and these have a um, relatively simple cell wall, but they have a really thick layer of a chemical called peptidoglycan. Um, and when we stain these types, they are going to stain a purple. The other type is called a gram-negative bacteria, and they have a lot more going on in their cell wall, um, a lot more moving parts, lipopolysaccharides on the cell surface. Um, and because of that, gram-negative bacteria are actually uh, more harmful to us because they're, they're a lot more complex. Um, but having said that, they have less peptidoglycan, less of that molecule, um, and they stain pink. So I remember purple positive, negative with the N, pink N. That's how I remember that. So here's a look at this, gram positive in red, that really thick layer, peptidoglycan, gram negative, um, a lot more complexity here, and then in, in red, a very s small layer of peptidoglycan. Okay, three main shapes of bacteria. First, we have bacillus, which is just a rod shaped, and I do want you to know um, a common example of each. And so E. coli, here's its gram negative, a uh, very common example of a rod-shaped bacteria. The second one is called cocci, which is simply these little spheres, and the most common example of that would be staph, staphylococcus, and that's what this looks like under a microscope, and this is gram-positive, and you can see that it's purple versus the pink. And the last main shape is called a spirochete, which is just simply a spiral. Um, this is Borrelia, and this is the bacteria that actually causes Lyme disease. Let me just show you a real quick um, video on, on how bacteria reproduce. Now, you should remember this from earlier in the year. So that should be coming back to you. The DNA has to duplicate, the cell elongates, and then it eventually splits. And this allows bacteria to grow very rapidly, and each back new bacterial cell is identical to the one before, right? It's asexual. Now this week, we're going to be working with bacteria in the lab, so I just want to inform you of how this works. The first thing that's really important to understand is the idea of aseptic technique. Um, this simply means that anytime you work with bacterial cultures, you're working on, in a sterile condition. And the best way to do this is to use flame sterilization. And I want to show you just a short clip of how microbiologists use flame sterilization when working with uh, bacteria. Important things to notice in that video is whenever you're working with a bacteria and you've got your petri dish, you never leave the lid open because things can get out of there and things can go in there that you don't want. So never leave that open. Anytime that you're using a inoculating loop, you're using that flame to sterilize it. And anytime you're working with a tube of bacteria, you're passing that tube mouth through the flame like that lady did in the video. And I'll remind you of all those when we go into the lab. So you might be thinking, what are those plates, those petri dishes? Well, what's in there is called auger, and that's just simply a growth medium that has nutrients in it to help culture or grow uh, the microorganisms. And so here are some examples. Um, they're all different types of auger plates. This is called a blood, a blood auger plate. Um, so different bacteria grow better on different types of plates. And when we look at this bacterial plate, we see um, this is a nice picture of an individual colony. So colonies, in there's lots of bacteria in that one colony, but each bacterial cell is identical to each other in that one colony. So you spread your bacteria on your plate, you stick it in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius, and each bacteria is different, but usually within 24 to 48 hours, you're going to get some good growth. All right, let's move on to viruses. Now you might be thinking, hmm, what domain of life do viruses fall in? Well, the answer is no domain of life because viruses are considered non-living. Remember, way back in the beginning of the year, we talked about the seven characteristics of life. Well, one of those characteristics was the ability to grow and reproduce. Viruses cannot reproduce on their own, and it's for that reason that the majority of scientists would consider a virus to be non-living. 
So viruses require a host cell, so in a, in a sense they're a parasite. So what they do is they inject their DNA or their RNA, whatever nucleic acid, into the host cell, and then they sort of manipulate and take over the host cell's machinery, all the, all the um, organelles, in order to reproduce uh, more viral cells. So here's a very simple picture of what that looks like. So here's our virus. It gets into the host cell. It takes over the protein machinery, the endoplasmic reticulum, and it creates more viral viral cells and then the vir new viral cells are released from the host cell. Just a little bit about viral structure. That it's actually quite simple. Um, all viruses are different. There's such variety in viral structure. Um, but the two common features are a capsid, which is just simply a protein coat. And so here's the protein coat on this flu virus. Um, here's the protein coat on a tobacco mosaic virus. The protein coat on a bacteriophage. Remember, we talked about bac bacteriophage early in the year um, with the Hershey and Chase experiment, right? And then the rotavirus, that's a bacterial coat. And then what's inside is your, their nucleic acid. Again, a lot of variety. It could be RNA, it could be DNA, it could be single-stranded, it could be double-stranded. Um, but that's always going to be inside of that protein coat. There are two different types of viral life cycles, lytic and lysogenic. On top here, we have the lytic cycle. Um, in this cycle, the host cell is immediately destroyed um, because the virus is going to um, get in there and it's going to take over the machinery, it's going to replicate, and then it's going to burst the cell. Okay, so this is the cell bursting. Um, what might happen though is called a lysogenic cycle, and this is down here, where in red we have the viral DNA. It actually gets incorporated into the host genome, and it actually replicates along with the host genome. And it can remain like that for several years until something kicks it into the lytic cycle, um, and that can happen, and then it would burst the host cell and make uh, more viral cells, which I guess they're not really cells because they're not living. Um, some common viral infections, common cold, that's a virus, the flu is a virus, smallpox, chickenpox, polio, HPV, herpes, um, a lot of STDs are caused by viruses. The main one I want to talk about though is HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. This is now considered a world pandemic, and just one statistic, there are lots out there, but in 2009, 2.6 million people were newly infected with HIV. It's transmitted through unsafe sex, contaminated needles, breast milk, and infected uh, mother to baby. So what does it do? Well, what it, it actually attacks our immune cells, um, and because of that, what happens is it progresses to such a state where that patient develops AIDS. So first you get infected with the virus, and then the virus attacks your immune system and you develop acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So HIV is the virus, and AIDS is the disease that comes after it. They're not the same thing, and I really want you to leave the class knowing the difference between HIV and AIDS. So AIDS then, the disease, is characterized by a failure of the immune system, and so patients usually end up dying because they have some sort of infection or a cancer that their immune system uh, cannot fight. So here are some symptoms of HIV infection, uh, sores all over the, all over the body, fever, uh, just headaches and muscle pains, and here's the actual HIV virus. So again, here's the protein coat, and then um, the RNA viral genome. Talk a little bit about treatment for bacterial infections. You can simply take an antibiotic. An antibiotic is going to inhibit the growth of bacteria by targeting various cellular components like the cell wall, the cell membrane, DNA synthesis, or protein synthesis. But remember earlier in the year with the evolution unit, we talked about the threat of antibiotic resistance. So if you take antibiotics when you really don't have a bacterial infection, say you just have the cold or the common flu, that antibiotic is not going to work. And so you're going to actually um, cause antibiotic resistance because there might be bacteria in you that are resistant and you're actually just selecting for those. Remember natural selection and so those are going to survive, reproduce, and cause more bacteria that are resistant. So here's just a figure here of all the different ways that an antibiotic can kill or inhibit the growth of a bacterial cell. What about a viral infection? Well you can actually prevent a lot of viral infections with, with something called a vaccine. A vaccine is going to stimulate your immune system um, to produce antibodies for that virus um, with a weakened or dead virus. So you just get a, a dead flu into your, into your system, it stimulates your immune system, so the next time you see it or later in the year, you'll already have those antibodies. But the question you might be asking is, well, why do I need a new flu vaccine every year? And the answer is, a lot of viruses, especially the flu virus, 
mutate every year. They evolve, right? They're constantly evolving. And so we, as with our medicine, we have to constantly evolve as well and produce vaccines that are going to actually work against the newly evolved virus. Um, so you can prevent them, but they're difficult to treat. And why? Well, because they're not living. All of these things that work for bacteria aren't going to work to uh, inhibit the growth of a virus because viruses don't grow and reproduce. They take over the host cells machinery.